Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for being here this evening for this very timely and important conversation about the future of the Democratic Party. My name is Steve Edwards. I'm the executive director at the Institute of Politics, and we are so pleased to have you with us for tonight's discussion. Just a second, I'll turn the podium over to Rachel to formally introduce our speakers on this outstanding panel. Some of you may have been with us, though, a couple of weeks ago when we did a companion conversation looking at the future of the Republican Party um, here at the Institute of Politics, all of which are part of an ongoing series during winter quarter of this year, exploring America and the Trump era. And as I mentioned then, for those of you who are in the audience, you know, during so much of this past campaign, so much of the analysis was focused on uh, the future of the Republican Party during the campaign and what many um, saw and perceived to be uh, a dismantling um, in our midst during the course of that primary campaign especially. Very few people were focused on the future of the Democratic Party and I think as we all see, um, the questions facing Democrats today at all levels of government are as pressing as they've ever been. Um, one of the things I want to point out um, tonight is that um, you can take a look at many of our events in the America and the Trump era series by going to our website at politics.uchicago.edu. If you haven't checked it out, I highly encourage you to do so. There's some terrific conversations, but um, none more poignant, in my opinion, than the one that took place last Friday between Van Jones at SE Cup, led by our own David Axelrod. A um, quick bit of housekeeping, now is a perfect time to make sure your phones are on silent. Do so. During the course of this conversation, we will um, move to audience questions. We'll put a microphone in the center aisle here. And because our mission here at the Institute of Politics is to cultivate the next generation of public service leaders, we ask that you reserve the first three questions for students. Thereafter, the floor opens to anybody here who'd like to pose a question. Um, speaking of students, it's my great pleasure now to um, yield the floor to Rachel Newberger, who is a third year in the college majoring in environmental science. We couldn't think of a more fitting person to introduce this program because she is president of the University of Chicago Democrats. Please join me in welcoming Rachel. Good evening. It's an exciting day to talk about the future of the Democratic Party for obvious reasons, and we couldn't have a better panel to hear from on this subject. Our four speakers each have crucial perspectives to share from their respective positions throughout the party on the dynamics that are fascinating observers of the DNC right now. In his two terms as mayor of South Bend, Indiana, Mayor Pete Buttigieg has focused on returning economic growth and civic engagement to a former manufacturing city. He is also a member of the US Naval Reserves and paused his term as mayor to serve in Afghanistan in 2014. Other than his recent run for chairman of the DNC, you may recognize the mayor's name from his 2013 performance on the piano with the South Bend Symphony Orchestra. <laughs> Simone Sanders served as National Press Secretary for Senator Bernie Sanders' presidential campaign, a role that earned her widespread recognition as a young American shaping the 2016 election. Before joining the campaign, Sanders was an organizer working for juvenile justice reform. She now serves as a commentator and a communications and outreach strategist. In 2006, in 2006 the Honorable Patrick J. Murphy was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives from the Pennsylvania 8th using an aggressive get-out-the-vote campaign to win a competitive election in a Republican-leaning district. Murphy was the first Iraq War veteran to serve in Congress and co-authored legislation repealing Don't Ask, Don't Tell. In 2016, he was appointed Undersecretary of the Army by President Obama, and he was an, a fellow at the IOP here in 2015. In 2010, Kasim Reed became the 59th mayor of Atlanta, host city of this weekend's DNC meeting. In his two terms, he has reopened recreational centers as youth safe havens, he has improved city services, and he balanced a multi-million dollar budget shortfall. Prior to becoming mayor, he served for 11 years in both houses of the Georgia General Assembly. Mayor Reed was also a fellow here at the IOP in 2014. Moderating this conversation is David Axelrod, director of the Institute of Politics. Please join me in welcoming our panel. First, thank you all 
uh, for being here. People say uh, that uh, where, where's the, the bench, where's the team, where's the, in the Democratic Party? Here are four uh, dynamic voices of the Democratic Party, uh, all worth hearing and all worth uh, watching. But I want to take you, I want to start by taking you guys back. And I, I'm riveted by you already, but I'm actually sitting on the edge of my seat because if I sit back here, they'll have to have a crew come and pull me out <laughs> at the end of this program. Um, I want to take you back to uh, November. Uh, we were sailing toward an election. I think it's fair to say there was a great deal of confidence among Democrats until about 8.30 on November 8th. Uh, and I just want to go down the row and say, what the hell happened? <laughs> we got beat. That's what, and that's the first thing that I, that I think we need to recognize because yes, Comey, yes, uh, you know, Russia, yes, popular vote, but Democrats need to confront the fact that, first of all, this race never should have even been close. Uh, and at the end of the day, we lost it. Uh, and so uh, I think we really need to look at how we connect in communities like South Bend and in the industrial Midwest and other parts of the country. Uh, I think we've got to take a harder look at um, what we're doing to make sure that folks feel like they have a relationship with the Democratic brand. Uh, and we've got to make sure that uh, when we do put forward candidates, it's not all about the candidates, whether it's our candidates and how great they are or theirs and how terrible they are, even when they're exceptionally terrible. Um, because when it's all about the candidates, the voters at home are left wondering, okay, but who's talking about me? Simone, you worked for uh, uh, a candidate who was um, not at a central casting. Uh, unless, That's one way to put it. Unless it was back to the future. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yet he did connect with people in places like uh, South Bend, this 74-year-old uh, uh, Jewish socialist from Vermont. Democratic socialist. Democratic socialist. <laughs> Campaign's over. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> Always on message day. <laughs> so uh, why did he connect and why, why, at the end of the day, did Donald Trump connect with some of these very same voters? I think Bernie connected because he was uh, talking about the issues. And regardless of what your issue was, Bernie would wrap that in there. So if your thing was clearly the economy, you know, the thing was we live in a rigged economy kept in place by a system of corrupt campaign finance. He talked about the economy. He talked about what he would do to help put more money in people's pockets. He talked about college tuition and education. Now we can have a debate about if it was feasible or not and if people felt his proposals were um, attainable, but he talked about the issues people wanted to hear about, and he talked about them often and for a very, very long time everywhere he went. Uh, and I think that's why he resonated with so many people, especially young people across the board, whether they were black, white, Latino, Asian American, Native American, or otherwise. I think Donald Trump was successful because Donald, Donald Trump had a very clear message. Donald Trump was always on message. If you ask people right now, what was Hillary Clinton's message? What was she like for? They won't be able to tell you. But if you ask what was Donald Trump for, we'll make America great again. He's gonna bring back the jobs. Now again, whether you believe he would bring back the jobs or not is one thing, but Donald Trump had a very clear message and the American people, particularly younger voters, older voters too, they want specifics and I think Donald Trump lied, but he was very specific. <laughs> and there was a, there was, but there was a relationship between his message and the Sanders message, which is the game is rigged and you're on the wrong side of it. Yeah, that the, yeah, that, you know, again, people work 40, 50, 60 hours, 60 hours a week sometimes, and they cannot make enough money to put food on the table to feed their families. That why are these billionaires and millionaires enjoying all the, the fruits of our labor? And that resonated with people. That resonated with young folks. That resonates with people in South Bend, Indiana, and Warren, Michigan. I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. That resonated with those folks. I think it's supposed to be billionaires and millionaires. Billionaires and millionaires and gazillionaires. <laughs> but it's crazy because Donald Trump is, a, well, he, we don't know. We ain't seen the tax returns. But he's a millionaire. He, how did the millionaire sell hardworking people across America that he was going to come back and be their savior? I'm baffled by that, but that's how he did it. I don't think he'd even mind since you, if you acknowledge that he's a billionaire, you can say what you said. So, <laughs> Patrick, you, you, uh, you served a district in suburban Philadelphia that is a classic kind of swing district. And in fact, 
you, uh, you, you won it in an up election for the Democrats, and you were one of the victims in 2010 of the Republican uh, sweep. How, from your perspective and from that constituency, did you see the election? What lessons do you draw from it? Well, uh, there may have even been a, a billionaire, I don't yeah. know, in your district. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, well, I'm still paying my college and law school loans off, so <laughs> I'm definitely, and my wife, so you know, I'm one of those still paying it, and I'll be paying it for a while, and I have a 23 years left of my mortgage for my home. Um, this is a non-paying gig. You yeah, know. yeah, I know, hey, it's all right. <laughs> You know, but Simone is right, David. Listen, Donald Trump won my district, won Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Um, and part of it is that when you just look at the sheer numbers, it was a change election. And Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump tapped into that. Two thirds of Americans thought the country was moving in the wrong direction. Now granted, Barack Obama had an approval rating of 55% on election day. But the country still felt disoriented ever since the fiscal recession of 20, 2009. And they wanted someone to tap in, and those, both those candidates tapped in to that disorientation, that, that anger that, that Washington wasn't getting at. And, and I will tell you, um, you know, when it comes to pocketbook issues, when it comes to things that they generally care about, um, you know, Donald Trump was on message in a sense that he said he wants to make America great again. He may have flip-flopped 180 degrees on certain issues, whether it was Siri or anything else, during, but he was on message and he was aggressive. He played to win. There is a reason why Donald Trump had five times the amount of coverage of all the other candidates combined. Because he would go, no matter what the network was, he would go there and talk about his message and pivot to what he wanted to talk about. Now, he didn't raise and spend as much money as other candidates in the general election, but he got that free earned media. By, and consort, I think that's, by you know, consorting with the enemies of the people. Yeah, well, listen, at the end of the day, you know, most folks, you know, not necessarily in this room, but most folks in America who are the voters out there aren't paying attention like we all pay attention to politics. They, they just see what they see and, and they get a gut feeling. And you can't take away the fact that Donald Trump uh, was a fighter and he had a message and he was going to take it no matter what. Kasim, you, you have as good a political gut as anybody I know. Uh, would, did you go into that election with apprehensions? Yeah, I mean, David, for me, the deal was the campaigns matter. You still got to run good campaigns. So without throwing our friends under the bus, uh, there are glaring challenges with the campaign. And uh, had we won, they would never have been revealed. But it does not take a master to look at the things that we should have done differently to flip 80,000 votes. The second thing is, is that I think that we have blown the conversation on transition economics. And really we aren't fighting the fight to make people excited about changing jobs six times or seven times rather than fearful about it. The third thing is I think that as we approach the campaign, Democrats went too far with when we can win without them. I don't believe in running campaigns where you take the approach that we can win without you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you have that message, you push people into the arms of Donald Trump. And I think that there was a constant message that I saw that caused me to have fear. When we started losing Iowa, we can win without it. Then we started losing Ohio, we can win without it. Anytime I'm in a campaign where people in the room as opposed to saying, I'm gonna go win that thing. Put me on the ground in Iowa, put me on the ground. I just don't believe in that feeling. And I think that when you have a campaign that says that we can win without you, you inflame people who resent that. And I think that we absolutely blew that as Democrats. Gotta be able to talk about transition economics. If you're gonna be for saving the planet, and climate change, all of those things that I'm for, you can't let Donald Trump win the argument that he's going to save the coal industry. But if you can't go to West Virginia and say, the challenge is that the coal industry is real, but my goodness, if you are in wind or solar or other industries, we're not just going to talk about it, we're also going to put cash into the programs to make sure that your job isn't taken away for 20 or 30 years. On all of those things, we blew it. 
And the, the, the bottom line is, is that campaigns matter. Comey certainly impacted the race, but the bottom line is we know you gotta go to Wisconsin. You can't narrow the amount of time that folks can go knock on doors to two weeks. And the last point I wanna make is this, and not just because we're here with David, there are things that we learned from President Obama's campaign in 08 and in 12 that we completely tossed aside. I mean, in 12, I remember President Obama telling me and a small group of us that he understood he wasn't the fresh new car anymore. And so you know what he did? He didn't quit. What he said was, I want you and the handsome guy from Grey's Anatomy, Jesse, the Jesse Wood. Yeah, the world and the, the women love. <laughs> and he said, and I want Russell Simmons, I want you all to meet in Ohio. And I want you to get on a Winnebago. And I want you to drive. And when, the, when Jesse came out, the women erupted. And then Russell came out. And people from the street and hip hop. And then I came out and talked about policy. That was the president understanding that that energy might have not been there, but I'm going to find a way to bring out the people who I need to bring out to win in 12. We didn't do any of that in, six, in 16. So I think we're at a point where we're not stabbing anybody in the back to have a real analysis of what a great campaign looks like and that we have to make an agreement that no matter who our nominee is, we're not gonna sit on our hands while they run a campaign that we know isn't going to make sure that you win Donald Trump or not. Hmm. Is there anybody who wants to make the argument that it was a great campaign? I don't think so. Um, Simone, you, uh, one of the issues, uh, there was, I, I think in addition, and maybe this was in, included, Mayor, in your, response, uh, in addition to saying, Iowa, we don't, we're not gonna, we don't need you, Ohio, we didn't, don't need you, it seems to me that there was a message that said, we've got women, we've got minority voters, we've got young people, Absolutely. and therefore we don't need white working class uh, voters. But that was, uh, and the presumption was that Donald Trump would drive uh, those voters to Hillary Clinton, but that, that in, in many cases, that didn't happen. It didn't happen, and uh, there was literally, I mean, I, and I've said this before, I had people told, who told me, well, we've got black voters, and young people, they're gonna come out. And I'm like, young people are not coming out, and I, if folks remember, there was a New York Times article, front page of the New York Times, maybe two months before November, two, three months before November, and it was all about black millennials, and how black millennials were basically not feeling Hillary Clinton, and uh, that, Churches and HBCUs were not going to cut it in 2016. And I got hammered because I said the churches and HBCUs are not going to cut it in 2016. And th that was something we, we kept talking about, that young people are not just going to come out, that black folks are not just going to come out because they really need you to speak to them uh, in, in a real way. And I, I do believe that that is getting lost in our post analysis. Because there are so many people that are saying, well, we just need to talk just about the economy, and we need to make sure we're focusing on working class people. It's code for white people, like black and Latino people aren't working class. And we're not talking about how black women were not highly engaged. But we came out and we voted at 94% for Hillary Clinton. But no one specifically came and talked to us. We're not talking about how millennials of color are not just on college campuses. Those folks that voted for Obama, like me in 08, I was a college student. Now I'm a young professional. People have, people have businesses. They, own, they have families. They're not on college campuses. So how do we reach them? So I, I, I absolutely, 100% agree with the mayor. Um, I also agree that you know Comey did some stuff. But we just didn't do some things well. And when we talk about going forward, we have to talk about, yeah, Comey, Russia, we still have questions, we still need answers, but what are we going to do well next time? And the next time for me is in 2020, the next time is 2017 and 2018. Well, well let's, let's talk about that because clearly Donald Trump is defining the political environment right now. And that's the environment which the Democratic Party is now uh, trying to uh, re reconstitute itself. 
Um, how, Mayor, do we approach that? Uh, and how much should uh, the Democratic Party think about its own message, and how much should the Democratic Party be involved in, in chasing the Trump rabbits down the hole? Yeah, I think it's incredibly important because uh, Trump, I, I've begun thinking of him as like a computer virus. You know, a lot of computer viruses get into a system, right? And they, the, the way they mess up the system is they, they come up with an equation that doesn't have a solution. And uh, they force the processor to cycle through this impossible equation until it finally basically overheats and breaks. And that's kind of, I feel like Trump is a computer virus on our psyche, right? He comes in several times a day. These things happen in Twitter that don't compute. And uh, especially those of us who expect everybody in politics to follow some kind of rational process. It, it almost literally blows our minds. Um, but more significantly, it ties up our energy. And so we've got to figure out a way, on one hand, to resist, because you cannot allow some of the things that are said or done by this administration to pass without resistance. Every falsehood has to be met with a fact. And yet, while responding to everything that requires a response, we can't allow him to dominate our imagination um, for several reasons. First of all, we need to continue cultivating and developing what we believe, what our values are, what policies follow from those values, and what candidates we'd like to promote who are going to enact those policies. Secondly, uh, for persuadable voters, it's, uh, it's not a great way to win people over. I mean, the, the thing that I think we often miss as Democrats uh, is we're still, some of us are still waiting for that, that final insult, that thing to come along that's finally gonna prove, it's like Lucy, you know, Lucy's <laughs> holding the football, Charlie Brown's <laughs> running up to it. This will finally be the thing that brings him down. Maybe there's actually something that could possibly do that, but if it hasn't happened by now, we really shouldn't be banking on it. And we're waiting for the thing that's gonna prove he's not a good guy. Oh. And that's a great example of what happens when uh, you don't listen to, to some of the people who voted for him, because the people who voted for him, at least where I live, already know he's not a good guy. They decided to vote for him anyway. They decided to vote for somebody they thought of as an outsider who they disliked rather than somebody who they viewed as an insider, who, you know, when people like Bernie and people like Trump, uh, and Trump's version of it was all lies, but still, when he said the system was rigged, we sounded like we were saying the system is perfectly fine. And that wasn't convincing because it wasn't true. Uh, so we've got to find a way to balance our energies, to resist all the things that need resisting, and somehow not let it be the thing that dominates our energies. Because the thing that's really, I think, the, what the beginning of the end of Trump looks like isn't outrage piling upon outrage to where people finally turn against him. It's us having something to say that's compelling, coupled with him getting boring, with people just getting sick of it. There's so much coming from him that we just can't take it anymore, and we start looking for something else. And we've got to come up with something else. Kasim, we were talking earlier about uh, your concern that um, these voters as Pete said, these voters voted for Trump knowing what his liabilities were. Mm -hmm. Some of it may have been antipathy to Hillary as a sort of avatar of the status quo in their view, but some of it was that Trump was talking about jobs and he was talking about their livelihoods and he was talking about issues that were central uh, to their lives. Your concern is that the, app, that the willingness to withstand some of his antics will be pretty high if he just comes through on the one central promise, which is, is jobs and income. Yeah, I mean, my sense of uh, President Trump is, is that uh, he likes simple plays, dive left, dive right. And as long as he gets three or four yards, there's nothing that's gonna, dive left, dive right, and you do what it is. I think that's what he did. He made a calculation during the election that he was going to juice every single white vote, no matter what he had to do in order to juice it. And he was going to put that up against coalition politics. And I think similarly, he is making the judgment that he will do everything that he can to deliver on his, to his base. And then he will make some accommodation that allows him to spend a trillion dollars on infrastructure. And I think his theory of the case is, is that if he has a roaring economy, during the election cycle that he's gonna win. And everything else that he did regarding immigrants, um, regarding transgender individuals, you name it, regarding the Muslim ban, 
will all be noise if he has a roaring economy. I think that he's going to create an environment uh, where he has a tax holiday for foreign capital. I think he's going to allow repatriation of that foreign capital back to the United States. Folks say there's a trillion in foreign capital, trillion and a half. I think you take about a quarter of a billion of that, you leverage it for a major infrastructure program. And I think that unlike President Obama's initiative, he's not going to have to cut a deal that's going to take 30 to 40 percent and put it in tax cuts. He'll be able to take a trillion and put it out. And I think he will also study what caused the lag in President Obama's initiative when we spent $784 billion in capital to save the United States economy and when President Obama bought 4 million jobs early on in his presidency. And the bottom line is, I am very concerned that it would work if we don't start talking about it. So it's not just that, it's not just that the economy is rigged, it's that Don Trump rigged it. There's got to be another. I mean, my message isn't just that it's rigged. Your hand is on the rig. You, you are Oz. You're the guy behind the curtain. And so I think that we need to look at what he's doing and have very candid conversations like the one we're having tonight, because that's what I think is coming. I think that he's going to do all of these things that are grossly inflammatory. And I think that he's going to deliver on a major infrastructure initiative uh, when you and I were chatting. The date that he said, I'm not getting to infrastructure until 18. Well, isn't that convenient? <laughs> right? And then he says he will have a playbook of the United States of America from President Obama's administration. He will be able to look at what every city in America had in mind for its infrastructure needs. He will be able to look at what city executed on getting their infrastructure projects done. Because you know what they know and what they learned from President Obama? Spending a trillion dollars is hard to do intelligently. But if you start spending it in 2018, around 2020, given the economy that he's inherited from President Obama, it really starts humming. And if Democrats don't have open, serious conversations about that reality and go and chase the other issues that are so inflammatory, I think we'll be where we are again, because when we're out in Michigan and we're out in Wisconsin and when we're in Pennsylvania and in, in your district, Congressman, their eyes are going to glaze over because they're going to say, I'm doing better than I have in 20 years. And then when you remove the racism that was tied to the economy that President Obama built, then you'll have economic indicator numbers that are favorable. You've had the economic confidence go up just because Republicans are now saying they feel good about the economy. When the economy we're operating on is President Obama's economy. 75 straight months. So, 75 straight months of private sector job growth. Right. So, so, so this raises the question, where we're going. Uh, uh, what do Democrats do? You're a mayor, you're a mayor. Uh, you probably have some infrastructure needs yeah. in your city. You have infrastructure needs in your city. We know we have infrastructure needs uh, in this city, and, and, and every community in the country does. Uh, so the, the operative question for the Democratic Party is, do you cooperate? Do you support uh, the infrastructure that Obama tried to get for six years and couldn't, and that you know the country needs? Or do you not do that because you don't want to aid and abet the strategy that you're discussing? So, I mean, I throw it out to the floor. I mean, I think in a way this is symptomatic of, of, of the, the way the question's been framed, because we get that question a lot, do you co cooperate? It, it presupposes this environment where the president's tr asking Democrats for something, like a negotiation. And at least as long as the situation on the Hill is what it is, I'm not sure he actually needs us for much of anything. Um, in a city, if, if we're going to get resources to help our community do better, of course we're going to use them. Uh, although, of course, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors around the, the likely structure of this infrastructure package mm -hmm. in the way that it will yes. work. Um, but I think the, the question, do we you know, compromise or resist, is the wrong question. because, the, And it's a consequence of years of Democrats organizing our politics and strategy around Republican politics and strategy. I think we organize around our values and, and the policies that flow from them which he's going to routinely 
insult. And then if by chance, I mean, if he decides that he was for a, he's for a minimum wage hike to 15 bucks, I don't think Democrats are going to fight that. In the same way that a broken clock is right twice a day, he might um, do the right thing once in a while. We, we'll have plenty of other things to fight on that I don't think we need to spend our energies fighting something he might blunder into doing well. Dave, can I Patrick, just, can yeah. I, I'm very passionate about this issue and not infrastructure. I'm passionate about my country. Mm -hmm. And so the question you're asking yourself is, yes, did the Republicans stand in the way of an infrastructure bill in the Obama administration when the Democrats controlled? Did they not vote for the stimulus bill even though that was the right thing for the economy and for a nation? They stood in the way and they put party over America. But two wrongs do not make a right. So Ax, if you're asking this panel, if you're asking me, and I'm looking, and if I'm an elected official, whether I'm a mayor, a congressman, a senator, whatever, and you're saying, they're putting up a bill for infrastructure that's going to put people back to work and answer the, the challenges that is affecting everyday Americans out there, I say, hell yes, I'm going to be for it. And we should be for it. It doesn't mean you can't be arguing about, you know, the Muslim ban and, you know, what you're seeing today, you know, the anti-Semitism across this nation. Um, Ten states had issues. We had 100 uh, cemetery plots in a Jewish cemetery turned over in Philadelphia today. I mean, you argue where you could argue, but you pick your spots. Where you don't fight, if it's good for your constituents, it's good for America, you don't get the party ahead of our nation. Well, I'm a staunch member of the resistance. And um, I think that, I don't think Democrats should allow themselves to get played. The fact of the matter is, you do need Democrats to pass an infrastructure bill in Congress. They can't get an infrastructure bill without Democrats. So I don't think they should allow themselves to be played. So. Um, if you'll notice, Leader Schumer has not come out. When he first came out, he said, you know, we're going to work with Trump where we can work with him. If it's infrastructure, if it's trade, you haven't heard that talking point. Because the people in the streets, the base, these, these folks on the left that are energized in these cities across the country, they do not want to hear that. And so Democrats are going to, in my opinion, allow themselves to be played if an infrastructure opportunity comes to the table and they giddily get up, run over there, get what they can get, and come back because it's going to be all for Donald Trump. So I think there has to be a strategy about it. I wholeheartedly don't. As much as I want to say, after the infrastructure bill, after everything else, we are in these streets. There are, there are cities that need this across the country. But we have to have a strategy about it. And the strategy just can't be, we're going to work with Donald Trump, or we can work with him, and that'll be a win for us, too, as Democrats, because it won't. This is not but business your, as usual. But, your, that's, but that's, a, that's the issue, because the, the one shift in America is that the executive branch, the presidency, the White House, has gotten so much power. So I do want to see Congress act like they're a co-equal branch of government, which they haven't acted. I mean, one of the biggest, the two biggest responsibilities of, of the U.S. Congress is the budget and whether or not we send our young men and women in the war. And the Congress is punting on both those things. The Congress right now is punting, saying, President Trump, give us your budget. It, it's Congress's responsibility. But secondly, on the war, I mean, President Obama, and Axel will tell you, I mean, he was asking the Congress, hey, give me a new AUMF. It's authorization for use for military force because the fight against ISIS is, isn't included in the last two AUMFs. And the Congress punted because Congress does not want to do the hard things that affect everyday Americans. So do I want to see Schumer and these guys, you know, in Congress? Well, I want to see them all get a backbone. But I, what I want them to do is pick their spots, not just say no, just to say no. I want to see him say no when it's wrong for America. Yeah, I just want to be clear. I'm just talking about what I think he's doing. I mean, my point is he ran a play that we all saw. And I think that this guy runs basic plays. His theory of the case first time was that I'm going to juice every single white voter, no matter how many people I have to offend, because I think I can get more white voters than Romney. And he had a, he had a primary And play. he prevailed. Yeah, right. And I think now his theory of the case, I'm not saying that I agree with cooperating him. I view everything with him as a case of first instance. But the point I'm making as Democrats having a conversation about the future is if you don't see this play coming down the street where he's going to do every single inflammatory thing that he ever promised the base that got him elected and then swing around and try to cause the economy to be explosive, we need to grapple with that reality that's coming to us is my point, and we need to have a plan for it in 2017 
on the campus of the University of Chicago, not when we're trying to deal with it in an election cycle. Because right. what we're, we got 2018 coming up where they're trying to go for constitutional majorities. That's why I don't think it's a mistake that the whole push around infrastructure is gonna be launched in 2018 because they're trying to get the 60 Senate votes while we are gonna to have to have people that can do what? Reach across the aisle in order to hold our Senate seats. That's the conversation yeah. I'm trying to have. Yeah. Well, if it has to begin here on the University of Chicago campus, it's a good thing we're sitting here tonight. We can take care of it right here. That's right. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I wanna ask Patrick this question. Uh, you come, there, there are some 25 swing districts. There aren't as many swing districts, certainly, as when you were uh, in the House. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are about 25 swing districts, most of them in areas, uh, areas like yours. There's a group uh, now uh, called We Will Replace You. Is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. uh, and their basic posture is any element of cooperation with Trump will, gar uh, will draw a primary challenge. Um, you've got a senator up as well in 2018, Senator Casey in Pennsylvania. There are 10 senators up in states that Donald Trump won. Um, it, this seems to me like kind of a vice for those, uh, for those candidates. And, uh, and Pete, you come from a red state. In fact, yeah. you guys all come from red states. So uh, what do you do with that? Well, I think it goes to the point of it's okay you know, when I ran in 06 and won, I was the second Democrat in 100 years to represent Bucks County and part of Philadelphia. You know, part of it is I talked about why we should fire the incumbent, but I also talked about why I should be hired. So when you talk about the resistance, and I think what Democrats need to do, and we're talking about Schumer and, and the rest of the Democratic leadership in Washington, but across America, say, talk about why he should be fired, talk about the, the, what's going on out there, but also say, this is what we stand for. This is what we stand for about putting America back to work again. This is what we stand for for, you know, American jobs bill. This is what we want an infrastructure bill, and this is what our plan is. And if he comes and has 90% of it and having that tax holiday, whatever it is you're going to pay for it, then you say, I'm glad he came to us because this was our plan. But if you sit in your hands, just wait and be reactive all the time, you're not playing to win. You're just playing why you're anti. You have to do why you should be hired and what vision we have for the Democratic Party. And the Democratic Party has been for the working man and woman in our history. And we have to get back to our fundamental roots. And when you look at the top two issues that face America this past November, and if you look at next November, it's going to be jobs and it's going to be national security and terrorism. And if you don't have a cohesive message on that about how what your policies do to affect everyday Americans, then you're wrong. And it can't just be why you're anti-Trump. You, That's uh, how I feel about that, if you haven't, you know. <laughs> Could you just go over that again? I'm just, uh, uh, Pete, you've got uh, Senator Donnelly up, uh, and uh, he's one of the people who's under maximum uh, pressure here. Uh, what, what does he need to do to win? Uh, because uh, obviously, um, as, as, as Patrick points out, you can go deep in the hole, or, yeah. or Kasim did, you can go deep in the hole uh, here and have a, a veto-proof, uh, I mean, a filibuster-proof majority if you lose six of those 10 Democratic seats. That's a dark place. Uh, you know, we, we've got to make sure that we are winning in every kind of district and in every state, and a lot of times that means vulnerable Democratic incumbents in red states are going to be staking out more moderate turf. I mean, at a certain level, it's, it's, it, it's, it's not even that complicated. Uh, I, I think it's reasonable to be for the most, you know, if you're a committed progressive, be for the most progressive candidate who can actually win. And the answer to that question is different in Indiana than it is in, in Portland. And that's okay. I mean, we, we have a diversity of opinion within the Democratic Party. Uh, there's way more that unites us than those things where there is some of that diversity of opinion. Um, and I think we, we need to recognize that not everybody is going to conform to uh, you know, what we think of as, as a sort of obvious um, test of, of, of purity uh, on the left. But I also think the, the left versus center spectrum is beginning to lose its usefulness. So for example, one of the things we learned in this last campaign is the extent to which many of the same voters who uh, wound up voting for Trump or who think of themselves as independents or even conservatives were actually available to Sanders and nobody else from left to center um, because there was an economic core and this sense of 
commitment to fairness that was there that really cuts across. I think we really got to get it out of this 90s mentality that the most important uh, question for Democrats is where to array ourselves on a left to center spectrum. Uh, because I think, especially for a newer generation of voters, that spectrum is less and less useful in explaining what we actually believe. Simone, do you agree with that? To an extent. I mean, I agree that what I, what I also hear is that we, we do need to have a plan. Um, I do kind of think that this left center deal does not work everywhere. But we also have to give our people some cover. I think about Joe Manchin. There, I go places all the time and people are like, we're going to primary Joe Manchin. He's in West Virginia, y'all. If you've ever been to West Virginia, you understand why Joe Manchin has the position that he does, but we're not giving him any cover. We're just letting Joe Manchin run up in there in the White House, sit at the table with President Trump, no cover. Whereas he looks like he's, quote unquote, betraying his democratic values when he's really going to the mat for his constituents in his district. We are not telling our story well. We're not defending ourselves well. We need a better message, and we need to give our folks some cover. I mean, you, Neil Gorsuch. Um, the automatic thing from the, sh from the streets, the people across the country was, resist, resist, we don't want, resist, say you're gonna vote no. When the messaging going out there to the people should be, we have to give our folks some cover. So if we, people wanna vote no, we need to be able to lay the groundwork for why it should be a no vote. So when he was announced, the, all of the statements should have been, I'm troubled, I'm concerned, but I wanna hear more. I'm, I'm going to meet with him because that's my duty as your representative, but we're not having um, strategic or coordinated conversations right. within the party about what we do to give our folks some cover, how we give our message on that piece, and then what we do to talk to our constituents. It's just, it's just so fragmented. So every what? time I see Joe Manchin run up in the White House, I'm just sad, because I know people are, literally, they want to put him on the stick, these progressives, folks in the street, the folks that say, we will primary you, they want to put him on a stick, because they don't understand that it's not the same all across the country. Oh, but the, some of those folks were very much in your camp. They absolutely were. You have to talk to them. There's levels. You have to talk to them. And I think the thing that um, Bernie did well is that he literally tried to talk to everybody because we felt everyone was up for grabs. But when you don't feel like everybody's up for grabs, when you feel like we can win without you, then you don't see your message as trying to reach some different types of folks. And the message should be, we need more and better Democrats. Mm -hmm. So more Democrats, because their first vote is, you know, it's gonna be for either Chuck Schumer or for the other guy, or it's gonna be for Nancy Pelosi or, or for Paul Ryan. And, and when you say better Democrats, it means more progressives. More progressive, but I would but, even but say not Democrats. I mean, so I really, so younger voters, 46% of young people identify as independents. These are folks that are never going to put a D behind their name. So I think the focus should be less on what we can do to make people want to quote unquote join the party and put a D behind their name, and what more can we do to make people want to work with us, fill us on our issues. Bernie is one of those new blue crew, blue, new blue crew Democrats, as I like to say, folks that won't put, won't put a D behind their name. Bernie is not a Democrat. Let me help y'all. He's a registered independent. He was a Democrat for the election. <laughs> but he's a new blue coat Democrat. He's somebody that is not going to put a D behind his name, but he's doing the work. But, but he believed in the same what millennials believe, that they believe in equality, which is the fundamental principle of our Constitution. And so when you talk and you do the contrast, you talk to millennials, this is what the Democratic Party stands for. We fought for this. We repealed Don't Ask, Don't Tell. It helped usher in marriage equality. We were there for the civil rights. They, versus what's going on now, that's where you have to make the contrast. But it's, again, that argument that, you know, the Democrats, you want more Democrats and better Democrats. And you want say better we just Democrats. Need better candidates, because right. there are people that right. do not want to hear the D word. Right. See, I think, Patrick, I, I, do, I do wonder whether uh, making the sort of institutional party argument. No, no, is, uh, I, I, I agree. I no, mean, I think people, sure, right. yeah, these, but, these, I think a lot of people in this audience are probably making the judgment based on the substantive arguments of candidates and, uh, and less on sort of the history of parties. Although the question is, does that change in the era of Trump? Do people say? Uh, I, I think it is changing, David, because I'm telling you that, you know, at the end of the day, campaigns matter and candidates matter. Yeah. And so you could talk here and you could call the center and say, don't vote on this person, that person. But, you know, unless you get your team in the game, you're on the sidelines. But See, but, but, well, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say parties matter, too. And, I, you know, we're living through this scrambling of, of ideologies and parties we got a president who doesn't even have an ideology. It's part of what makes him so scary. He's, he's not conservative. But he got himself a party. Yeah. Yeah, well, he uh, threw a hostile takeover, right? <laughs> and, and 
What scares me is watching the Republicans be, become like the Democrats used to be and vice versa. And I'm very worried about this because it, it matters what combination of commitments your party has. The thing I fear most is, if you look like, look like the 20s or, or even the 50s to some extent, you, you look at the Republicans, and it was a party that was authentically, uh, for the most part, more forward-looking, uh, better on social justice, racial justice. Uh, it was the party of educated people in the cities. Um, but it was also definitely the party of the elites and the moneyed interests. Then you had the Democratic Party, as it then was, which was unquestionably authentically the party of, of, of the working person, um, stood up to, to wealth and, and inequality, and also home to some of the most awful racist and nativist elements in American politics. I don't want to live in a world where those are our two choices. And so we've got to make sure that, that the parties still cohere even at this moment, where on the Republican side, we have a president who's not moderate or liberal or conservative, but he's Republican, allegedly. And then, and then on, on the Democratic side, we've got all these folks who uh, don't think of themselves as Democrats, even though I really want them in our party and not just voting for our people. Yeah, I'm, I'm in a little different space. Um, I think that we've had a moment of clarity and that it's like taking a teaspoon of cough syrup. A teaspoon might help you get better, but the whole bottle will make you sick. And that's what I think we're going to experience it with President Trump. There is a clear difference between Democrat and Republicans. So I sit here, maybe I'm old fashioned or maybe I'll be cast aside, but the Democratic Party means something and what we have accomplished and what we stand for means something. And I don't think that we should abandon trying to encourage people to be Democrats. And I don't think we should walk away from the work. And one of the things I like uh, sitting here and listening to Simone is the insight that it would take you to do the work, which is the harder role as opposed to saying, well, let people feel how they want to feel. I believe that you get down and you express, ask somebody, what would it take you to become a Democratic Party, part of the party? And this is what we have accomplished. And I think you do that work. And I think that one of the biggest mistakes we made during this campaign was to let it sit out there that there was no difference between a Democrat and a Republican. There is a massive consequential difference that is visible every day now. Yeah, you're and I just wanted to share that because I'm just a little, I'm, yeah, I'm just in a little different place. I don't believe all of this free flow, how you want, you don't need a Democrat. The Democrat Party has done things that I think move the country forward. And I think the Republican Party does things that are harmful in very clear ways. And I think that we lose by acting as if the D or the R doesn't matter. So I just wanted to share that because there were Patrick, different Patrick, let me, let me just divert you because we have to take questions. But I, I want to divert you to a, a question I, I told you I was going to ask you, which is yeah. you served for the first couple of terms in Congress uh, under a Republican president. Or was it just one term? Two just terms. One, just one term. One term. Bush, one term and then you served, uh, you served a term under Obama. So you've been in the minority and in the majority. Which was easier? De definitely when we were the minority, when we had President Bush. Because it's easy to be against something. It's easy to tear stuff down. It was harder, you know, when I was all in on Obamacare, the Affordable Health Care Act, and there was town halls and I had death threats. And I still showed up at the town hall. I still, I had them. One time they had a protest outside my office on a Saturday, and I showed up by myself. My little Ford Escape I showed, and I had the copy of the health care bill, all thousand pages, and they were waving the Tea Party flag, don't tread on me, and I said, come on. And, I, and the first guy, I said, sir, you have a veteran hat on your veteran. You asked the first question. He, had, he took out a piece of paper and he's reading. He said, on page 846, it says all illegal immigrants will be given free health care. I said, sir, with all due respect, I have the bill right here. Attorney 846, I want you to read it to the crowd. He read it. It had nothing to do with that, by the way. And, we, you know, <laughs> and I said, sir, you're, you're an American veteran. You're a patriot, and that's why you're here. And whether you voted for me or not, it's your duty to tell the truth. You go back and wrote you that email, and you tell them that they lied to you. And, and, you know, and get that word out there. So at any rate, and then I showed them where it said in the bill, what it said. Yeah. But all I would say, to, one last thing. So it was easier you know, to be against something. But I will tell you, to, to Kasim's point, the mayor is absolutely right. The Democrats have to stand by the courage of their convictions. They have to stand for something. So when President Bush, 
you know, when the Democrats had power and I was there in Congress, you know, when they said, hey, we want to put the new GI Bill up, I was all for it. I voted for it. The Democrats voted. We, we had to put it forward and it helped. And then when President Obama got in, we actually strengthened it. And I'm proud of that vote. Just like I was proud, you know, to frankly, you know, vote for health care. And I was proud to vote for a stimulus bill. And I was proud to vote, you know, for um, fiscal um, constraints right. against the big banks. All I would say, though, is that I also went into it saying, you know, I love my country. And to me, as a devout Catholic, as someone who, you know, is, believes in democratic values, I also believe in my country. And to me, Judgment Day was more important than Election Day. So that Sunday before I went into my last, when I lost in 2010, that Sunday before, I didn't pray to win. I said, Lord, you have some plan. I don't know where it is, but I know I could feel it. It wasn't feeling real good, okay? Yeah. But, I, but I said, whatever this journey takes me, I'm in. And I, and I lost by six points, but I was at the train stations the next morning, and I thank voters for the honor to let me serve, serve them in Congress. Maybe you asked for the wrong thing. Well, <laughs> no, I, no, I, uh, let's go to questions. Yeah. Hi, my name is Matt Enlow, and I'm a second year student at the law school. I'm really glad you spoke briefly about talking about what we stand for as Democrats. I was a Bernie primary voter, but was also a strong supporter of the Vote Blue No Matter Who movement. It seems like voting lately comes down to who voters are more opposed to rather than who they support, leading to apathy and disengagement from the conversation altogether, much less campaigning for candidates in an election, be it local or national. How did the Democrats build trust with those who felt left out by the primaries in 2016 and by the recent DNC election? I think, um, thank you for your question. I think Democrats build trust with um, some of those Bernie primary voters, for example, that uh, don't feel like the party is for them by talking about, I want to be clear, I'm a Democrat. So, um, and I've been a registered Democrat my entire short life. Um, but by talking about um, the issues and talking about specifically what folks are going to do and then being open for feedback and bringing people in. I think what so many people liked about Bernie is that he was willing to open the doors. Um, and re regardless of how people feel about Chairman Perez, I think he's ready to kind of open the doors and let new, new folks come in and hear these ideas. And that's how Democrats build trust with these communities that don't, that don't trust them, that don't, they don't feel like they're part of the party, instead of saying that the people, the people that do the work are Democrats. Because although that may be true, there are people that do the work that are not Democrats, that don't feel like the party is for them. So if you are coming to the table saying the only people that are doing the work are Democrats and you got to be with us, well, if you're a person that's been doing the work and you're not a Democrat, you automatically feel disengaged and ostracized. So I think we have to change the conversation, use different language, be open, and put our money where our mouth is and, and get to work. It's my two cents. <laughs> but I mean, you know, I, mean, I don't believe in this false equivalency. Tom, I mean, this is some of the things I think we have to push back against. Tom Perez, a person who led the civil rights section, a person who was the most labor friendly secretary of labor, that's not my quote, that's union president's quote, a person who worked and served honorably with President Barack Obama isn't enough. I mean, I just, I think that we're pushing much of this too far. And that doesn't mean that I don't need to learn from you and learn what your issues are and change and grow. But this instinct that we have going on among Democrats is going to allow Donald Trump to get a supermajority in the United States Senate. And we have to work it out among ourselves. And the last point I want to make is this. If you beat somebody in an election, you beat them. And we have to get comfortable winning and losing as Democrats. If Pete had won in Atlanta the other night, I would have been completely loyal and for him. If Keith had won, I would have been completely loyal and for him. But if as Democrats, when we have elections among ourselves, we have to really believe that elections matter. So the person that beats you ethically and honorably beats you, and until the next election comes up, that's how we have to act. So we can't stand up and say, well, Tom Perez, as if he is Donald Trump's cousin, Willie. <laughs> He's not. He is a good, decent man 
both of whom's parents were laborers, who's lived the American dream, done what he's supposed to do, and he beat another decent man who he immediately made his deputy. When have you seen that happen among Republicans? So, I mean, I just wanted to add that to the mix because there's a spirit in our party which needs to be confronted. If Bernie Sanders had beaten Secretary Clinton, I would have worked my heart out for him. That's the Democratic Party. This thing, this deal we have when we have these running feuds while these people are banning Muslims and working to do a better job of on the draft, this is small ball. While some poor kid can't go into a bathroom that represents who he is while we're, at, while we're arguing over Keith Ellison's vote. There was a vote. We had paper ballots. Somebody won. There is a leader. You follow. We can't do to each other. We can't do to each other. But the Republicans have spent eight years doing the Barack Obama. He won the presidency. They spent eight years gutting him. When the country was on the line. When the country was on the line. You talk to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff for the United States of America, he'll tell you the biggest threat to the United States safety and security is not having an economy that can afford our military. The country was on the line. So I just want everybody, we can argue and have robust debates, but when somebody beats you, you need to fall in. But this running fight that we're having as Democrats is just something that, you know, I, I'm gonna be speaking up against it. And if I get put out of the party, I'm gonna be put out of the party, but we gotta have this big party that, that really supports all of that, so. So I wanna commend the speaker for drawing the mayor out. I think no, he did a really you. good job. We'll take the next. Uh, That's great, thank you. Then, <laughs> Hi, I'm Marcel. I'm a graduate student. Um, I think it's quite strange to talk about the failures of a campaign that won three million more votes than their opponent. And I'm wondering why it shouldn't be an urgent priority for the Democratic Party to work against the Electoral College, either through a constitutional amendment or the national popular vote. Electoral college that increasingly discriminates against democratic and urban voters. Can I just take that more so? I, th I think that's a great question, but I, I want to reorient, reorient yourself and the rest of America that they were the rules of the game, and we lost. Going, and I, I, I'm not happy. Forward. Going but, forward. Going forward, but I would say to you, reorient yourself in that everyday Americans out there, they're not waking up every day and saying, "Man, I had that electoral college. Man, we got to we got to fix that." They're waking up saying, you know, am I going to lose my job? How the heck am I going to get my kids to go to college? How, you know, what's going on? My son or daughter might get drafted. You know, right now we have over 100,000 American soldiers in over 130 foreign countries. That's the stuff that they care about. Now, again, Marcel, I agree with you. Like, I'm not trying to be a jerk. I'm really not. But all I'm saying is the Democrats that I'm proud to be part of need to make sure they focus, not pick every fight, Focus on what they can get done. They're not going to be able to get that done. We could waste a lot of energy on that. I'd rather focus on the gerrymandering across America and redistricting reform. So it's a fair fight because, by the way, beside the presidency, there was millions more votes for, for House Democrats than Republicans. And last I checked, there wasn't Speaker Pelosi anymore. It was Speaker Ryan. So I'm saying pick your fights. At, Respectfully, Marcel, I'm not trying to tell you. Okay, uh, I'm sure we got to pick pick our fights a little bit smarter. I would I, I would only add uh, that uh, until 8:30 mm -hmm. at night on November 8th, Democrats were saying, "Well, we've got an electoral lock; we can't lose." And so the game has been played both ways. I, I think that the system's deeply flawed, uh, but. Um, it's also the, the nature of it, the system is that it would be extraordinarily hard to change it. And it, it, Patrick makes a good point, which is most Americans aren't waking up thinking about, they're thinking about how they can send their kids to college, not about the electoral college. So, can we take the next question? 
Hi, uh, my name is Dylan. I'm a third year student in the college. Um, thank you all for coming. My question is uh, basically like you guys as well as the party as a whole seem to have come to this consensus that Trump won based on his unique ability to speak to economically anxious voters and that this is the assumption the party should operate based on going forward. And while I agree that this might be true in a few, in a few uh, specific anecdotal examples, I don't know, how would you square this overall narrative uh, with the fact that Hillary won among the working class, she won overwhelmingly among voters whose chief concern was the economy, both nationwide and in these three upper Midwest states that were the tipping point? P, one of you. Well, I mean, f first of all, I think we have to come back to this should not have been close. We obviously did something wrong here because this should not have, this, there was a preposterous game show host running the, the country right now. So clearly we did something wrong. I think in some ways the answer actually ties back to Marcel's question because I, I three quarters agree um, that, that the issues people think about are not usually procedural, right? I mean, even for me, I mean, when, when I think about what I have at stake, you know, my freedom to marry is on the line. Uh, my community is on the line. I'm still in the IRR. I suppose whether I go to war again or not is on the line. Uh, I have relatives on ACA and their lives are on the line, right? It's that basic stuff that people think about most. But I think he tapped in his own twisted way, he said something that was true. So like when he said our, our politics is rigged, people like me were clutching our pearls. How could you say such a thing? Um, when actually, I mean, it wasn't rigged in the way he said it was. That was nonsense that, you know, there's buses of illegal voters coming into precincts. But who can look at the way our districts are drawn in which, uh, uh, you know, politicians choose their voters instead of the other way around? What better word for it than rigged, right? Nakedly and transparently rigged. So there's clearly something about our political and economic structures that is manifestly unfair and broken. And the puzzle, I think, for our party, it should be a bipartisan thing, but it's not going to be. The puzzle for our party is how to speak to those fundamental bread and butter issues and still be serious about these process issues. Because the gerrymandering and money in politics and voter suppression. And by the way, in addition to the insidious targeted voter suppression, there's also just like, you know, having election day on a work day is, is voter suppression, right? Um, there's a lot of unsexy processed electoral college reform, right? Uh, and I, not in my lifetime, with the possible exception of, of the way that John McCain in 2000 got some college students excited about campaign finance reform. Other than that, not in my lifetime has a process issue really been sexy. And yet, I think in many ways, as a country and certainly as a party, Trump is nothing but us reaping the wages, uh, to mix a metaphor, I guess reaping the harvest of our inattention to these structural injustices in our economy and in our democracy that in this vague and twisted way he spoke to and we didn't because again, we sounded like the party saying the system's just fine. I largely agree with that. The point I'm making is you can't on uh, Monday talk about the, uh, celebrate the electoral lock that Democrats have and then, then Tuesday night say, but we're gonna reform that because it doesn't work for us. Then I think that makes people cynical and uh, you have to confront that. Uh, yes, next. Hi, uh, my name's Young. Uh, lots of my friends focus on the problem of the message or the messenger, but I think one of the problem is, that is overlooked by them is the mechanics of the race itself, the fundamentals of getting the vote. Uh, for example, back in, when Howard Dean was the DNC chair, he adopted the 50 state strategy. However, after Obama won the election, it seems like the party abandoned this 50-state strategy. So my question is, how could the Democratic Party balance the job of quietly and patiently building capacity within the state parties and the job of harnessing uh, the popular and grassroots energy like the women's marches to make marches into a movement? Mayor uh, Reed, why don't you uh, speak to this? Because it goes to resource yeah. allocation. Well, th th there are two points. One, um, we're going to need people that can speak to both constituencies to merge that group. So right now you're having marches with 60 to 70,000 people, but there's a backlash against people who know the mechanics of, mecha of campaigning in the Democrat side. And so there'll be no lists, no emails, no information to help you weaponize in a 
kind way that, that rally. <laughs> and so that's the conversation that we're going to have to facilitate. The second point is this. Um, Democrats are going to have to change the, uh, the lumpy funding model we use. So while we may raise more money than Republicans, we don't have consistent investments the way the Republicans do, primarily because of families like the Koch brothers. So with Democrats, you have to go and talk to people and nurture them for two or three months, but there's no money, and then the money spikes up, you ramp up, and then it goes down, whereas Republicans may have raised less, but it's more steady. And so those are two things that we're going to have to do right now to be ready for 18 and certainly for the presidency. I kind of added the point to Mayor, because I think Mayor Reed, what, what you're not seeing, there is an historical realignment going across this country mm -hmm. that absolutely we need a 50 state strategy. So you look at the state where he's from in Georgia and you look at Arizona. Those two states were super close for Hillary Clinton. She barely lost, where she lost a lot in Ohio and Iowa. So when you look at the historical realignment of Democrats and the country, you, know, you need a 50 state strategy. You need to be investing in Georgia. You need to be investing in Arizona, where in the past, the Democrats didn't do that. But Simone makes a terrific point earlier. The bottom line is the days, certainly in minority communities, not just black uh, communities where you can show up and do the churches and do all of this in the last six weeks, eight weeks, you've got to move to a Louisiana Rue gumbo strategy. It's going to take a long time to cook it right. and nurture it and support it right. and put tomatoes and okra and shrimp <laughs> and all at the right time right. because if you show up, well, you, you tell me you put the crab, I'll put the crab in. But the point I'm making is, is this show up strategy around minority voters um, just is not going to work. You're going to have to have steady communication. It's a lesson that the Republicans learned from us. After what President Obama did to the Republicans on technology in 08 and on 12, they decided they were never going to be beat on technology again. If you look at the kind of Facebook usage that they had to suppress the vote, so for example, they had one search program where they identified folks in Michigan who had looked up prison reform. And if you were a black person who had looked up prison reform, they sent you negative messages about Hillary Clinton saying super predators. Not to get you to vote for Donald Trump, but to make you upset with Hillary Clinton and not go out and vote for her. That kind of sophistication was funded at a steady stream over time. And I don't want to depress you, but it's a space that we're going to have to engage in as Democrats. Can I just uh, uh, graft onto that question and ask you, uh, over the past eight years, um, and starting with 2010, the Democratic Party lost 1,000 legislative seats around the country. Uh, now 33 legislatures are in, fully in the hands of Republicans, 32 uh, governorships. That's a, it's been a big and important shift. Uh, Kasim mentions the investment that the Koch brothers and others have made on the Republican side, but they've been very serious about focusing on legislative races, city council races, school board races. Uh, Democratic Party is very focused on the presidency. Um, how do you shift that, and do you need, do there, is there a need for Democratic oligarchs to emerge to accomplish it? Maybe not oligarchs, but, but yeah, I mean, the, the, the word I loved in the question was patience, right? Because that's what we've got to do. We, we can't treat the presidency like it's the only office that matters. If you do, you encounter all the, the uh, uh, I mean, we, we saw firsthand the obstruction and the things that went on in the last eight years, let alone when you don't have the presidency. Um, we've got to make sure that we're recognizing the significance of these state and local offices. You know, groups like Moral Majority started with school boards, and, 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 and it took decades. I think we've got to recognize there are different lanes here. There's the work that needs to be done and needs to be well-funded uh, that is at the community level and is very long-term. Then there's electoral work that's got to happen in the, it, through the state and local parties, because you're not going to sit in Washington at DNC headquarters and figure out right, what's going to work in state and local races. And then, of course, there's the work where most of our energy is already gone, the presidency and the Congress. Um, but even the Congress, of course, driven by state legislatures as we head to another redistricting year. So I think we do have to have that patience. And we do, by the way, another case where I 75% agree with a fellow panelist. As, you know, Tom Perez is the DNC chair because he won and he beat all of his competitors, including me. And we've got to unite as a party and get to work on that. One of the themes that came out of that competition for DNC chair 
was the importance of, of re returning to that kind of 50 state strategy. Uh, and I think what's important about it is not just the idea of paying attention or spending money in each state, although we need that. Um, it's the fact that we've got to have the states and even the local parties take the lead because they recognize the importance and the urgency and also the best tactics when it comes to those local races that aren't as sexy but are unbelievably important, especially when you add them all up and there are hundreds. Okay. Next Thank question, you. please. Hi, uh, my name is Spencer. Thank you all for being here. I'm a fan and Twitter follower of all of you. Um, so I think it's hard to overstate the extent to which we just watched an electoral wipeout of the Democratic Party. Uh, and for all that we can talk about the popular vote and everything else, elections are a zero-sum game right now. The GOP has unified control of the federal government, 25 states. I mean, I'm from Vermont. We elected a Republican governor, even though we have, as y'all might not know, a uh, Democratic Socialist senator. That speaks to something that I think goes beyond the tactical questions that I think it's easy to get bogged down on in the wake of an, of an electoral loss. Uh, and it seems to me that we should confront structural question, er, questions about the nature of the Democratic Party and the animating philosophy behind it. So I wonder if each of you could just share your view of what should be the animating vision of a better world that can be uh, behind the Democratic Party. And to slyly plug my own, uh, if you have any thoughts on universal basic income. Mm. So I, I just want to say in general, I think the current vision that the party casts is a great vision. Like I agree with the mayor and the congressman when they say the Democrats, like we stand for something. We have fought for X, Y, and Z. Like we have a great vision. We don't talk about it well. President Obama over the last eight years did all these really amazing things, but people don't know about it. Did y'all know that we have had 75 months of straight, of 75 straight months of private sector job growth? Probably not. So I don't think the party needs to rethink their vision or, or who we are. I think we know who we are. We need to get back to that and talk about that better and be willing to let new folks that don't have a D behind their name come to the table and talk to them and work with them, and even though they don't have a D behind their name, and talk about who we are, what we have done, but also what we're going to do and what we're doing right now. So the vision of the current Democratic Party, in my opinion, is a good vision. We good. We just need to talk about it. We solid, though. We real solid. I, mean, I agree that the values are, we have are the right values, but I do think we've drifted in our emphasis. And so there is a philosophy issue. The biggest one I think we need to work more on is freedom. So there are a lot of conservatives. I mean, conservatives kind of took over freedom as a rhetorical theme. Um, and there's a lot of young libertarians who I think ought to be Democrats, but we haven't spoken to them because we haven't talked about, talked about freedom enough. Uh, I think uh, we need to remind them that the, the, their blind spot is they talk as though government is the only thing that makes people unfree. So they're good at freedom from regulations. But like in my life, the freedom to pollute a river somewhere is not nearly as important as the freedom to marry somebody I love, the freedom to be free from student debt, uh, the ability to be free from uh, being jerked around by, by a bank uh, that is uh, mistreating me right, as a consumer. I mean, those are the kinds of freedoms that we are for securing. Um, I think, uh, again, fairness. As uh, I've got my four Fs, freedom, fairness, families, and future. We already talked about fairness. I won't repeat myself. There. I think family is another good one, though, that you know, really should be a democratic value, supporting family. We're the party that's trying to get your family a raise. And by the way, there are specific families in America that are under threat right now, be they LGBT or immigrant families, and we're the party for keeping them together and protected. And there's a lot about the future where I think, uh, um, just one point on the future, because you talk about universal basic income which is really interesting, especially you know, at a school like Chicago with these economic uh, uh, minds around here. I mean, <laughs> look, there's no law of economics that says that the market clearing price of an hour's labor is enough to live on. And I always thought that problem was gonna come due in you know, two or 300 years. It's looking like that might happen in our lifetime. And the implications of that will be profound and we'd better be ready. I uh, think, let me, I'm sorry, go ahead. <clears throat> I, I, I think that the way that we need to frame it is as follows. I think that the fact of the matter is we need to talk about whether you believe in a bigger, bolder, more inclusive vision of, the, of America, where you have a fair shot and a fair shake, or do you believe in the politics of subtraction, which is what President Trump has advocated for, where gay people are at risk, lesbian people are at risk, Hispanics are at risk, women are at risk, and, ask people, and lay it out that way and have people choose and make our case. The last thing is Democrats have to focus on candidates, 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 candidates. At the end of the day, somebody gets up and run for something. And even if you're a Democrat, if you put up a candidate that's a better candidate and run a better campaign, 
you know, you're gonna come out on the other side of it. So that would be my comment to you as somebody who's clearly passionate and focused. I think our vision is the winning vision. Big, bold, inclusive. Is that how you feel about America? These other folks are, are practicing the politics of subtraction. And we need candidates to go out and fight these fights and make these arguments. You gotta feel like beating somebody. Democrats, I'll tell you, one thing I see in Republicans, we wanna serve, they wanna win. Um, so, in, in, uh, let me add a, a fifth F to your four Fs, and that is we've gotta finish. So, uh, but, but before we do, before we do, um, let, let me just ask you this, because I think it's the question I get asked most often these days. There is an awful lot of energy out there, uh, more energy than we've seen in a very long time. Um, but people say, but what do we do? What can we do? So as, as, as Democrats, as people on the progressive side of the debate, uh, just a very few words on what, what should people be doing if they want to uh, be constructive in terms of uh, shaping the debate moving forward. Let me start, if that's okay. Run. We focus on the 536 federal elected positions, the president, the Senate, and the House. There's 600,000 elected positions in America. And if you love your country and you wanna say something about it, and if you wanna speak to people's hearts, not just their heads, and you can contribute, run for office. Don't wait for your turn, run. And if it's in a primary, it's in a primary. But put your name on the ballot, organize, and fight for the values that you believe in. I would say, uh, people always talk about we have to get organized. I would venture to say we need to get coordinated. I think we are very much organized, but there are folks over here doing stuff, and people over here doing stuff, and they don't even know about it, and they can help one another. Um, so with all this energy there in the streets, I think it needs infrastructure. I think the Indivisible Guy, now the Indivisible Project, is a really good example of the, in, these former staffers put out a guide of just how to engage with your elected officials. And people started organizing in their own states. So then it became the Indivisible Project, and they provided infrastructure for that grassroots organizing. Priorities, we helped fund some digital ads to help people know about these recess town halls that were happening to support the indivisible project and those people in the street. So I would just say we have to get coordinated and uh, a lot of times it's providing infrastructure for that grassroots enthusiasm. Say so look local. Uh, the, um, obviously the time will come for federal elections and it'll be on us pretty soon, but you know, for example, to testify in a committee hearing and change the outcome of a vote on legislation in the city, you don't even have to be invited. You're mad about Betsy DeVos? Uh, don't get mad, get on your school board. Uh, look local because the very same values that are at stake in these federal and national politics, and when the time comes to guide that into electoral action, will be there. But they're already at stake in things happening in your backyard that you might not even know about. So before we even get to election day, look at the processes that you can impact at every level, including those closest to home. Kasim, any thoughts? Yeah, I just think you should beat somebody or help beat somebody. <laughs> We all are students of history. We all read about great folks. We believe that if we had been around when Roosevelt was around, we would have been with him. When Truman was around, we would have been with him. If we believed that if Dr. Martin Luther King was walking this campus, we would have ran out of our dorms and been beside him. We believed if when President Obama was running in 08, if I could have been there with him, I would have been there. Ladies and gentlemen, what we're going through right now is as challenging as all of that. And as opposed to being down about it, this is our moment. When I call my dad and I'm depressed, he tells me, and I'm pouting, he asks me, did anybody sick a dog on you today? <laughs> did anybody hit you with a water hose when you were getting in your car? This is our moment, you all. Think of all of the terrific people that you read about and admire, no matter who they are. They had a moment where they decided to do something. And I think that this is our moment. And I think you express it by beating someone who has a position that is hurting this country and hurting our communities.
And let me just uh, add my own thought, which is in addition to all of these points, um, the, we have a, vi a vigorous civil um, life in our country. There are civil institutions that have already demonstrated uh, their power uh, in the face of some of the things that we've seen, uh, you know, who've, uh, lawyers who've organized to help people who were being, uh, uh, caught, who were caught up in this immigration uh, order, uh, people mobilizing around uh, women's health issues and, um, and a whole variety of other uh, issues. And, and so um, there are a lot of people, who, a lot of organizations that uh, marshaled their support behind Martin Luther King. It wasn't just the politicians. In fact, at the beginning, it wasn't the politicians at all. So elections are important. They're important in the off year. They're important in the on year. But so are basic struggles around these issues that are going to impact on people's lives. And there are, there are, there are organizations that are active right now who are, uh, who are deeply involved in those. And they're going to be very important to the response to some of the things that happen in the next few years, and they need your support and your uh, energy too. But uh, having said that, there's no dearth of energy here. And uh, those who think that the Democratic Party is, uh, is downtrodden, beaten, uh, overcome by dismay and despair, they should have been here tonight because that's clearly not the case. And uh, I just want to thank all of you for, uh, for being here and for the leadership that you provide. Thank you.